Hello, friends, and welcome to Building at the Edges, a podcast from Seed Club. In this episode, Jess, or that tall guy on the internet, interviews Dina Burke and Natasha Hoskins, co-founders of Boys Club, a social collective bringing new voices to the new internet. They break down exactly what that means, as well as the current structure of Boys Club, how the DAO fits into the larger brand, how the brand can become profitable, and their choice to focus on building the media business first. They also discuss bootstrapping versus venture funding, community growth versus audience growth, and they have a really interesting conversation on how the belief in a brand is what makes a brand valuable. Enjoy the show. Dean and Natasha, wonderful to have you on the pod. Welcome to Building at the Edges. Thanks for having us. It's so fun. We're excited to be here. All right. So there's like a million things for us to get into, which I love, but let, let's just start off in level set. Like, how are you describing what Boys Club is today? Boys Club is a social collective bringing new voices to the new internet. What do you think, Jess? How does it land? That's it. I mean, okay, first of all, merch games on point, brands on point, one-liners on point. The, you guys obviously have skill sets as that. And also, what the hell does that mean? Mm. <laughs> Great mm. question. Mm. Great mm. question. Mm. I would love to dig into all of the things that it means. <laughs> um, okay, starting with Social Collective, it's a club of people. It's people who are interested in and excited about emerging tech and how it relates to culture and our daily actual lived lives. New Voices is our way of pointing to and sort of signaling around amplifying women and non-binary voices to be at the forefront of all the things that we do, all the things that we talk about. We're unapologetically feminine in the way that we show up in the world. So that's getting at that. And then the new internet is people building at the edges. It's, you know, Web3 and crypto, but we're also thinking about other emerging tech that is changing the way that we work and the way that we make art and the way that we hang out with each other. So that's what all the little sections mean. But I don't know, Dina, do you have more to add? I mean, we can get into what we actually are in the world. I think that covers it. I think that... We've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the first phrase is that follows Boys Club is. And we've landed on Social Collective, not on accident, but because the community and the sense of sort of shared identity and vision and sense of humor is really at the core of what is Boys Club. And so... Social collective feels kind of like a clinical way to say that, but DAO feels like an unwieldy way to say that, right? And also it brings in all of these other things that I don't think needs to be there when you're just talking about really what Boys Club is, which is about a group of people who share a similar worldview and like to see that reflected back in each other. And so we express that through events. We express that through content, newsletters, memes, podcasts, and merch into what Natasha was saying about sort of like elevating voices and sort of building at the edges. That's really the function of the community in many ways, which is like to be a little sort of fertile ground for things to emerge from that Boys Club as a community can decide whether or not to pursue. So I don't know if that's kind of like a long-winded way to answer the question, which was, does that land for you? And the answer is yes, it does. <laughs> 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 so I, I love, but probably when we look back on it, there's this era of new types of organizations or brands that have sort of emerged. I think C-Club is one of them. I think Boys Club is one of them as well. There's sort of like this, it's the Web3, it was crypto, it was DAOs, it was NFTs, it was sort of, it was the, the dot ETH. You know, there's sort of this moment in time when all of a sudden a, a gap in the world opened up and, and new things could sort of emerge from it. And, you know, I think that happens frequently enough or maybe not frequently enough but but frequently and then also it's born out of this sort of newness and then there's about this sort of sense making and understanding as it integrates into the wider world around and it's sort of like the term DAO or, or token it's really useful for saying that it's it's something other than all that other sort of stuff but then also becomes very constraining at a certain point so is this sort of a new language or, or maybe the exploration of it is this part of a broader trend that you're seeing out there in the spaces that we inhabit where we're trying to figure out how to update our language or models in a way that are more approachable or, or I mean, it sounds like it's mostly for you all. It's, it's about better articulating what the there there is and has been. For me, I think we've come to the realization. Well, here's what happened. 
we started boys club. We got a bunch of people in the room and it started to have this sort of gravitational pull. And so the DAO was really formed as a result of that very organic gravitational pull where something happened. And then there was all of these women who were sort of looking around and being like, man, I want to be involved in that in some way. I want to contribute to, I want to be a part of that. And off the shelf, the DAO sort of structure or like as a container, DAO as a container made a lot of sense for that, right? It made perfect sense for that. And so that is where the sort of DAO-ness of Boys Club came from. Now, we are a DAO because we have a shared bank account that we all decide how that's used. But some DAO purists may say, well, we don't have a token that's shared, whatever. Fucking sue me. I don't care. Like, it's we're a DAO. <laughs> but I guess then we were all in the room together and we we're all like, okay, this is fun. We're vibing. We're like, not without its many, many challenges, but there's some energy and a ton of momentum. And I think, you know, more recently, we've come to the realization that DAO is a great container. And it's a great way to organize a group of disparate people around a shared vision or mission, but it belongs in the stack. It's not the thing that we are. The DAO-ness of it enables the thing that we are, which is a collective of people who are interested in emerging tech and who are interested in how that tech intersects with culture, and most importantly, has an unapologetically feminine lens. And I think that that worldview and that lens is what people want and what they need and what they're resonating with, not that we're a DAO. The DAO just enables it. So I think for us, the Web3-ness of it is what we were born from and what we are native to, but it belongs sort of in the layers of how Boys Club operates and organizes. It's not like front of house, if that makes sense. It's back of house stuff. So that's kind of the shift that's been happening for us, I think, over the past couple of months. Yeah, I love that. Because I think one of the things I see that I really hope that we can have an impact on is there's often a very big lag between the insights that you gain from truly building a thing and what the market sees. And I think there's a a window where slapping down on something, saying we're doing this for Web3 people was enough to generate initial attention and and get out. But as soon as that became saturated to some degree or the the narrative moves on, that's no longer a thing. And I think what I'm hearing and how you're describing, I think is actually really important for people to recognize that the success of Boys Club today and into the future has literally nothing to do with the Web3 pieces to it. The success is due to your ability to build a brand and to connect and to create a place where people can come together and and create value. And and the crypto pieces are actually important from a a founding principle standpoint, but also, yeah, the rails, the tools, there's a whole bunch of new fun Legos and and things that we can go use to put things together in new and interesting ways. But absent that sort of meta real value, and and I think it, it can be difficult in the social space because it's kind of you know, I think people have called you a brand or a media company, or I like social collective, actually. I don't think it's it's sterile in, in, in any way. But it's hard to sort of put your finger on it. And yet, you know, for me, it's just like the most obvious thing ever. But it's also ephemeral in a certain way and hard to replicate, right? I don't think you can just go and do that again. If you did the same things you did over the last two years, nine times out of 10, it's probably not going to work in the same way. So I think it's important for people to really focus in on that value piece right now rather than the crypto piece. I think that narrative is... It's long past us. Yeah, I agree. I also think that it's like alienating to people. Like the whole sort of big purpose of Boys Club is to give individuals like an access point to explore and see where they can make their mark in the world and get into like crevices or places in the internet that they maybe otherwise without the safety or invitation of a community like Boys Club wouldn't feel like they could participate or think about where they could do something in that world. And I think when you start to really label things with DAO or like with these really sort of heady, dense ideas, you start to leave people out of the conversation unintentionally. And I think some people can look at that and think, oh, that's not actually for me or I don't fully understand it. So I'm just like not going to jump in. And so having a language that feels accessible to people in all stages of their interest in sort of innovation, I feel like is really important because that's a huge part of what we're trying to do is bring those people in and have them design the future that they want to see. 
I think that language is actually designed to keep people out I, and, and not from like a nefarious way, but it's about trying to like create space to articulate the fullness of the newness or the excitement or, you know, and, and in a large part, you know, putting boundaries up in some level is important for any subcultural group or community. And also I think it's important for us not to be overly attached to those things. It's fun having this conversation with you because I think both we can say like that is an unhelpful term or it's exclusionary or, or the narrative is past. And yet, like I know deeply that we all believe in just the incredible new things that can be built yeah. with these tools. And so it's like, you know, we, we wrote a piece a couple of weeks back called Crypto Still Wants to Be Seen. And I still believe that like there's true meaning and value in in these tools. And also I think we need to be, you know, looking beyond that just, I mean, for practical, but also I think you're right. The market is so much bigger out there for us to go after. And I know, yeah. you know, what's so exciting about what you're building is that you're actively creating and shipping and building stuff using Web3 Rails on a regular basis. So maybe that's a good place for us to turn a bit of our attention to. You know, so Boys Club is a DAO. Some people think it's kind of a DAO, but we don't care about what they have to say because we get to define <laughs> our own terms. This is welcome to the modern internet. But there's sort of a, there's a business here, right? Like this is not just a set of good parties and a great place to hang out on the internet. There's real money being created. There's real value being created. There's real time and effort and hearts being invested into this thing. And so I think it would be helpful for us to kind of dive into that. How are you thinking about the business of Boys Club today? How has that shifted for you? And I know there's a bunch of threads that we can probably pull from that. So what is the business of Boys Club? Yeah, that is a good question. I think that there's like many layers to the business of Boys Club. I think Dina and I have always from the beginning have had a really ambitious lens looking at Boys Club and seeing a lot of possibility and opportunity to make it a very valuable business and have always been trying to look for like, okay, what are the line items on a PL that like makes this thing not only sustainable, but like a big business. And so the first sort of inflection point of revenue was we did an NFT sale that was very much with the guides of wanting to fund the treasury, wanting to give the DAO and the community some influx of capital to do some stuff with that could support all the many things that we want to see come to life, primarily in sort of the DAO section of the business. And so we did that about a year ago now that funded the treasury that is community owned, that is very much living within the DAO. If we are like looking at the different sections of Boys Club. And it also gave some wiggle room to start to do some experiments because what we saw within our community and really what Dina was speaking to is this like, okay, a bunch of people got in the room and then everybody was sort of like, what can we build together? And there were all these things that ideas and ways that people wanted to work together. And clearly that's like a hotbed for incubation and innovation and collaboration between really, really talented people, like an insane talent pool that's sort of come together in Boys Club. So we started to run sort of all these experiments and that was really how we've been operating Boys Club primarily for the past 18 months is just like, okay, let's throw spaghetti at the wall and let's see what sticks and let's invest in areas where we feel like there's some momentum and energy around them. And what we've really seen is that there is a lot of momentum and energy around all of the sort of media properties that we've been testing. So the newsletter, the podcast, events have always been like a huge part of what we do at Boys Club and have a very distinct vibe around them. And as we were sort of like in the spirit of experimentation with this lens of, okay, how do we build a sustainable business here? What started to emerge is, okay, what is the DAO good at and what is the DAO not good at? And as we start to see businesses emerge, should those live in the DAO? Should they be spun out of the DAO? Like really starting to think about how can we do right by all of these emerging experiments and how can we make sure they have like the fullest life and the most operational flexibility to do what they need to do. So anyway, to come back to your question, the, the main business that we're focused in on right now is the media business, which is spinning out of the DAO, but with a revenue and equity relationship back to the DAO to like sort of see a vision of a world where there's all these experiments that are happening as they start to have energy around them and legs under them and there's some clear product market fit have a moment where we say okay does this stay in the DAO does this spin out of the DAO and does this become an independent business with a relationship back to the shared treasury in some capacity so the business we're really focused on right now is the media business and growing those properties and what we see is as those properties continue to grow that only 
serves as this really powerful distribution channel for any experiment that happens within the DAO. So let's say someone decides, I want to start a skincare line within Boys Club. And honestly, probably going to happen. (laughs) So like people are obsessed with skincare. They talk about it all the time. It's such a clear area where people in our community care about. So it's like, okay, let's say that happens. And let's say we've spent a year building up all of our distribution channels. There's this really powerful relationship that all of these things can have to one another, where there's built-in distribution to these products that we are launching within this world through the podcast and the newsletter and all these other areas. So it makes sense for us to invest in that right now. It's also a business that we can go and bootstrap and do immediately and not have to fundraise for, which gives us a ton of flexibility as well. So that's that's sort of where we're at right now. Yeah, only to caveat by saying you're talking to the two people in Boys Club who are very focused on the media company. So I think if you were to go into other corners of the Boys Club universe, you would find energy for different types of projects. Like in particular, there's sort of a little labs guild that's spinning up that is thinking about like, okay, what are some like software product tests that we could be spinning up and sort of testing? There's lots of disparate and varied interests across the universe of Boys Club. And that's the beauty of it. We have a very obvious bias because we're now in this like small startup environment around Boys Club as a media entity. But just to Natasha's point, that sort of serves the larger vision of a, a larger flywheel effect around Boys Club where media is one piece of the puzzle and there's 10 other that are driving money back into the treasury. So that's kind of the vision for it long term. So uh, I love doing these podcasts because even in that three minute spiel there i have 47 things i want to talk to you about that because I, I, I just see like <laughs> like i know the depth that goes into any of those answers like the amount of spinning around and turns you've done to yeah. try to find what the right path is here so i'm going to do my best to try to navigate this in a, in a logical way because i i'm actually very excited to hear what your answers are too but so i think the well okay now we're going here there's almost like this and you're saying that okay we're focused on media and then there's the dow there's there's this question or maybe a belief that I think has really taken hold over in crypto over the last little while is this idea of like the collective versus the founder. And maybe that's not the fairest way to sort of balance it off, but like, you know, there's maybe one angle is like great people build great companies, right? And often it's just one person. And they go, you know, if we look at from Jeff Bezos to Warren Buffett, maybe Buffett's two people, right? But there's like a lot of hard decisions need to be made. Making decisions at a collective is very hard, it often leads to some optimal outcomes. It's like the flip side is like the purest crypto side of things is maybe like, no, actually purely decentralized. We're going to be able to get everybody's genius in at the same time. We're going to go create. And I think there's actually like probably good arguments to be made on, on both sides. But the reality is when we we're having to make decisions and build these organizations, we're showing up in a certain way and have a certain belief set that probably gets showcased in our in our business. I'm curious, like, is there tension between the idea of being sort of founders and the DAO? Is there something there that maybe resonates? I don't even know what the right question to ask here is. Yes. Sure, there's tension there. There's tension there, but not unhealthy tension. I think it's normal. And I think it's all part of the game that we signed up for, which is we're building in a completely undefined and new environment and we're writing the rules as we go and we're trying to figure it all out together and so for the most part anyone that's certainly on the core team of boys club i think understands we're in a dynamic environment and these things happen so yeah i think just sort of on that level yes that exists but we're figuring it out i think that what we've learned over the past sort of like roughly year from being in a dow like environment is that There are certain things that the DAO is incredible for. And there are some things that the DAO is suboptimal for, like you've said. I think when you're needing to be very agile and nimble in finding product market fit for a very specific business, it's tough. It's tough to do that in committee. And I would maybe go as far to say impossible, at least for a business or a brand like Boys Club, which is not a, it's not ones and zeros. It's not a protocol, right? That we've built where the governance of said protocol can be broken down into very discrete tasks and decisions and can be voted on without any gray areas. Like we are brand first. We're community first. What that means is squishy and it's constantly evolving and it requires an incredible amount of context sharing constantly. And so that makes 
trying to find product market fit and challenging in a DAO environment. So that's why we've made the decision to spin out the meeting company, but it's not going to be right for every DAO. And I'm sure there are plenty of DAOs out there listening who think that that's bullshit, but that's the path we're on. I think it might be more right than not. And I think people might be kidding themselves. That's maybe my hot take as somebody who's definitely been on the other side of that argument before as well. And I think, so, you know, we we like to use the the phrase, build something people want to be a part of. And that's a really hard thing to go to. And frankly, if you can't go do that, who cares if you have ownership or membership in the thing, if it's not something that people want to actually be a part of. And so like, yes, ideally we could have, a, gr- a large group of people make tough decisions, have have taste, create something valuable and distribute ownership from day one. But that's actually intention far more than I think people, at least maybe we have given it credit for. So I love the fact that this is the path that you're all going to. I think it, it's like the more that Boys Club can be in a, in a strong financial position, the better place it's going to be for the wider network. And I think the approach of doing that with media, I mean, very clearly the right first bowling pin benefits everything else. And I know that there's half a dozen other sort of interesting points of energy that are bubbling up there that could turn into meaningful things. And I think we're also constrained by scale right now. We haven't seen massive, huge, successful communities or DAOs just yet. And I I think it's coming. And I think, you know, things that might look small right now, I think have a potential for being meaningful things in the future, whether that's media or that's incubation or acceleration, or that's people wanting just to, you know, buy a badge to say that I support this thing. I think they can all be really meaningful lines of business sooner than than later. My next note here is like, let's talk about bootstrapping versus raising venture capital. And the image I have in my mind is walking into East Denver in the conference, which kind of smells kind of like a stable because I think they they Mm -hmm. literally sold (laughs) horses in there like a week before. And what I come up to is, is a booth right front and center is a booth once you go through security of boys club and i think it was this DeFi daddy gear that you're actually wearing here attached yeah. to that right mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. the image i have is you is just clothes and, and pants and sweatshirts are literally just sort of flying up and people are buying stuff and so i'm like okay that is the snapshot of bootstrap founders people who are showing up building the brand selling some merch being in the middle of the mix so i want y'all you all to have that mental image of like the the hard the sleeves rolled up as i ask this question which is you know that clearly there needs to be capital coming into these organizations to allow people to go full time to continue to invest their heartbeats in the growth of, of these things to be able to you know accelerate the growth of them and i know that you've very thoughtfully explored the landscape i'm curious how you look at funding boys club moving forward is venture capital something they're interested in is this a, you're going to continue to hawk merch at the front of crypto conferences probably more scale oh, to that than, than we even think but <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a great question i think We have definitely considered it. We've definitely like explored what that would look like for Boys Club. And there was a moment where capital was very easy to come by or much more easy than it is today. And it was very tempting. I think Dina and I were both like, wow, we could quit our jobs. We could do all of these things, run all these experiments with like so much wiggle room to do those things and not be capital constrained, which we are every single day in every decision we're making when you're bootstrapping. But Dina and I, like, we've both raised money before. We've done the thing where we, like, sort of raised maybe from the wrong people and just, like, it sucked all the fun out of the room and it made it really difficult to have clear eyes about what you were doing because you had sold this vision of something and it just muddied the water just in a different way. And so... We both were like, okay, the next time we fundraise, separate from Boys Club even, like we want to be able to look each other in the eyes and be like, we have deep conviction about what the thing is that we are myopically building towards that is going to be a billion dollar plus exit. Like that's the story that we had to feel like we could really say to each other. And we couldn't get there. And we didn't want to raise with that pressure without having that conviction about like the one thing because that's really what we if we were fundraising and we were going to go raise money that's what we want to do it's like this is the thing that we're putting all the energy like all chips on that and 
now are in a different environment. And I think we've gotten a lot clearer about what we want to invest in. But a media business is a very particular kind of business that if you raise money into, you have a very different relationship, very different returns, different margins than, let's say, a software business or even a product business. And so we've had to be really thoughtful about, do we want to be in that type of position where you're sort of working your way out of a hole, where you you raise money for a media business. It's like, how do we get to 1 million subscribers tomorrow? Like, that's the path that you're on. And so for us, like, it's not a no. It's not like we're never going to fundraise. We, like, think venture capital is does a lot of great things in the world and allows for a lot of great things to be birthed into the world. And it's not a no. But we are very thoughtful about how and who we would raise money from and for what entity within Boys Club. And so I think we're just not like rushing into that and we don't need to like take advantage of a hot market or be put in a position where you feel that pressure every day when you raise. So it's like sort of two different types of pressure. Do you want to feel the pressure of having raised that money and the valuation and like that being on your back? Or do you want to wake up every day thinking about how much money is in the bank account and how we're going to bring in this much money for this thing? And for us, bootstrapping feels really right for us as founders, for the business that we're working on right now, and for the community as well. So that's sort of where we're at. But it's really hard. And like, I don't want to pretend like bootstrapping is like so fun because you're beholden to no one. It's great, but it's really fucking hard. And like, I have a lot of people who are like, you're doing it so right. (laughs) Bootstrapping is totally the way to go. And I'm like, have you ever bootstrapped a business before? <laughs> and it's really no. hard to hear. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't want to sugarcoat that at all. Um, so, anyway. Yeah, there was something that stuck with me. And I think Natasha, too. We had a meeting one time with Amanda Cassatt, Amanda East. She's amazing. She's from Serotonin. And she was talking about how she had bootstrapped business before. And she talked about a metaphor where you're driving a car on a road that doesn't have any suspension and is really low to the ground and like there's no pressure and and, like you can feel every single little thing every little pebble every little stick that and every imperfection in the road that you're driving on because you're so close to it and you're so connected to it and when you're bootstrapping that's your relationship to the business your relationship to the business is so intimate because you're as Natasha saying you're waking up every morning thinking about it and thinking about the money that's coming in and where the money's being spent. And that feels in your body a different way than if you raise venture capital and you have some cushion to figure it out. And both are appropriate paths for different kinds of businesses. I think if Natasha and I look at each other and we're like, there's a product that we have a ton of conviction in and we want to go and build that right now. And maybe we could wake up tomorrow and have that idea and have that conviction. And then we'd go and raise venture capital because if you're building a product and you need to invest in developers and building out the software, then like makes a ton of sense. And I would do it in a heartbeat. But I think for us, it makes more sense right now for us to like be very sober in the face of what this business is because we haven't figured it out yet. And it's a little baby business right now. And in order for it to get bigger. We need to have all of our eyes on it all the time. And so that attention, I think, is unique to the situation of, of bootstrapping. So anyway, that's the decision that we made for now. But it, you know, we could talk next week and be like, oh, we're going to raise a big round because we figured something out. So we reserve the right to change everything we, we say here because right. yeah. welcome. Yeah. So I, I love this. So I, I feel like this is actually comes at maybe because when I look at a boys club, I go, I would not describe it as a media company, even though I understand why describing it as a media company makes sense right now. And I think, you know, you're a, a prime example of what maybe is better called uh, what, to, you know, Toby Shorn in his after lifestyle post calls a cult, right? Like, and, and let's use that cool. term very broadly, cool. right? I know, because it's like, a, and, and it's definitely like a guy, I used to have very we long are hair, matching, a big beard. So us being cult you know? leaders, like really. Yeah, right, there you go. I'm like, oof. So, okay, the, you know, audience, please give us some latitude in, in this word here a little bit, but, but I think like, you know, when we look at, I guess one of my core theses for C club generally is looking at crypto as more of a social project than a technological project. And this, it's the cumulative belief in something that actually creates the circumstances for it to exist. Right. So Bitcoin, how many proof of work blockchains are there out there? Right. Well, Bitcoin, yes, was the first. And also 
has the most, you know, people have laser eyes and they're, and the narratives change, but there's, it's the belief of it. And it's purely that belief. Sure. It's electricity being put into it and there's utility underneath it, but it's really in a large part driven by belief. And I think Ethereum too, we can make an argument that it was this idea of a world computer. Clearly there's utility, right? We're not, not suggesting that it's just purely belief that, that holds the value here. But I think what's interesting to me is thinking about, and especially as we see NFT communities emerge, we're seeing Maybe not the end form, and I would agree with you. It's probably too early to say it's fully form, but there's this this window where that belief can actually manifest value in a very shocking and effective way, right? So it's our collective belief in the Chromey Squiggle. There's 3,700 of us who want to hold it rather than sell it, and therefore there's 200 million dollars worth of market cap in this in this network. So when I look at Boys Club, I think like what you have done is the hard thing, right? There's any number of new crypto projects start up every single day or week, and most of them aren't able to capture attention, and most of them aren't able to get people to give a shit about it in any way. And so when you're able to capture that, I mean, at C-Club, that, that they think you described Boys Club as sort of like this the energy that sort of emerged, and there was just a thing that happened. That, that's very much my experience with, with C-Club as well. And so it feels very much like lightning in a bottle in many ways. And so I think it's my belief that maybe take it out of like the, the venture capital lens, but that there's actually more of a product there. There's actually more of a network there. There's, maybe I wouldn't go so far as to call it a, a protocol that, that is actually, say, investable in the sense that it can create significant value over and above what, say, a media company would be valued at in the market or a software development company or, or a internet community. And so I, th- I think what, what's interesting, and I know, you know, we have a ton of history and, and talked a bunch of times, I think I've, I've agreed many times, disagreed many times. I, I feel like this piece right here is maybe, I mean, maybe this, that's the right question to ask. Like, do you see the world in that way too? Do you agree with what I'm saying there? Or is there a fundamental difference that might be worthwhile getting into? I think brands are very powerful. I think affinity to a brand, you look at something like Supreme and the only reason Supreme is what it is is because people are obsessed with the brand of Supreme. Or you look at luxury goods and you look at a Gucci or a Louis Vuitton or whatever. And like those things are valuable and high quality. But the reason that they are what they are is because the belief in the brand and people's affinity to the brand. So I have a deep belief in brand value independent from the product that it puts into the world. Dean and I joke all the time that like, part of why the work is hard is because at any given moment of the day, we're going back and forth between thinking boys club is the most valuable thing in the entire world. And then the other flip side of it is this is a dumpster fire. (laughs) And like, there's nothing here. And like, and and in any given moment, like our inflated sense of self is either like totally off the wall or like completely in the trash. Like, it's like, we can't figure that out uh, in any given moment. But because I think we are, very pragmatic. And we are like operators and are looking for sustainable reoccurring revenue for this business. So like, I completely agree with you that there is something insanely special about Boys Club. It is magic in a bottle. Like, I've worked on other things before and you are working so hard for someone to care about it. And that is not the experience at all with Boys Club. And that is like a gift. The other feeling that comes up for me when people say that to us is like, I'm a fucking idiot if I can't turn that gift into a business, <laughs> into a real business. And like, that is the pressure that I feel. Just if we're being really honest about it, that's the pressure I feel. I do agree with you that like, if there were venture capitalists that were like, we're making bets on brands and not businesses, that like, Boys Club should be at the very, very top of their list. But they have to be along for a wild ride of trying to figure out where that reoccurring revenue comes in. Dina, you're gearing up to say something. No, I, like. I totally okay. trust everything you're saying. Totally trusts me. And and I think you're right. I think it's like, yes, brand. Yes, community. Yes, there's something, there's an intangible value here that no one has figured out how to price yet. I think Steph Crypto Honey tweeted about that the other day. Yeah, it's, it's unclear how we're pricing these, how we're valuing these communities. And we are... The prime example of that. And so on one hand, yes, absolutely, Jess, totally with you. On the other hand, as two pragmatic operators, we're still like 
feel confronted by that. And so maybe the time horizon is just longer and we just need to be patient and and be like down for the ride. And we are. And that's what we're doing. Basically, that's kind of the path. I'm very willing to make a bet that that's correct. I I think people are pricing it. I think there's a lot of volatility in that pricing and we're feeling the extremes right now for sure. But people have priced it. I also think that the biggest challenge is probably more one of a regulatory challenge where like the ability to say, hey, we've built this community, this brand, this network. And the fact that you can't go and say, hey, let me go sell you some of these tokens. And that my continued desire to to say that I want to be a part of this cannot be actually effectively done today in the, the regulatory environment actually might be one of the biggest changes. Because I think Boys Club will be a prime example of this type of business. I think it is the fact that you're pushing back on all this stuff right now that's ultimately going to be real because I think you'd be in a way worse position today if you had just leaned into that fully and and just gone all degen on it. It just wouldn't be true to anything if you know if you're not to yourselves, not to your brand, etc. And also I think that some version of that's going to come along. And and like you sort of said, Natasha, this idea of like people investing in brands and not companies. I think that is like a trend that is very, very much going to come to the world. I think we already see early examples of it. I mean, NounsDAO, if we look at and, and NounsDAO, what they've done is they have a mechanism for being able to sell tokens that represent belief in the brand and do that every single day and generate tens upon tens of millions of dollars worth of value. Now, oh, set of other questions around how that value gets turned into something, et cetera. But I think we start to see pieces of it. So yeah, I love it. I get to sit here and have just like ridiculous conviction in the opportunity here and also uh, an empathy for the desire to do it in a sustainable way because it's very much, yeah, I don't know, I wouldn't have never called myself a pragmatist, but I very much identify as one in Web3 or on crypt- crypto Twitter, I think. It's like, yeah, we need to make decisions that will allow us to be around. I can't imagine doing anything else. And so I have this deep desire to build Seagull up into an institution that lasts far beyond my involvement in it. And my intention is for my involvement to be very long lasting. I get the sense that there's a similar vibe from you two here. And so, yeah, I I think both have like long-term conviction in that value being represented. And also I think you're totally right to, you know, we just need to make sure that we can stay in the arena right now. We can continue to get up and, and move forward because I think there's an inevitability of the advancement of technology and narratives here that's going to play in our favor, even even in the United States. Well, I'd love to hear that. Thank you. Just give me, give me a ranting. Let's go. If, if you were <laughs> if you were giving us a pep talk, but the pep no, talk I, was, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, felt it, yeah. I, I think it's. I think these conversations are important because there aren't many places where we can have sort of like the the honest conversation about the tensions that exist in trying to to build. As you hear like over optimistic hype, pump mm-hmm. by my bags type stuff, or you hear. You know, like the, the practical doom and gloom, not even yeah. that, just the practical realities of like, well, where's the revenue going on? And yet yeah. in between, we start to see like the spe- speckles, I think, of real businesses being built. And I think we all as founders in the space need to be like, that's the important thing for us to do is to go build something that somebody can point to and see, see, they did it like that and it's working. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. I know we have only a couple more minutes left. We're going to do an ad hoc sort of rapid fire stuff. Okay. And so we'll see where this goes. Give me the rundown on Zine and why that's just like the perfect project to build as a community. So Zine, we did a fidgetal experiment with our I love love that word. That's my favorite word. And (laughs) we did a printed edition of a Zine and we did a digital version of Zine and we did an open edition around the launch of the Zine an open edition mint. And what that zine project revealed was, yes, it's a century old format, a magazine, but it's perfectly suited for a DAO, right? We brought a bunch of disparate voices into one edition of a thing and marked a moment in time, represents a moment in the Boys Club community as represented by all these different contributors and all these different voices. And has a lens that was applied to all those different things. And we're excited to do our next one. We're starting to think about it. And it feels like just really, really well suited for an expression of a DAO. And the print version, I think, gives it a sense of like just having something tangible brings a sense of realness. I mean, it's really special. So you're out there on the streets handing them out. So it's like the bootstrap founders. Yeah, Game literally last... <laughs> in, in South by Southwest handing them out on. Yeah, on... <laughs> Weather looked great. How are we thinking about community growth versus audience growth? This is like the least fair question to ask you to answer in, in two minutes because I'm sure it's like a big thing. But <laughs> Go like, for it, Natasha. Yeah. What, okay, I'll, what, what's I'll your answer? Yeah. I mean, so pretty early on, we realized that 
there was something really special about community that had a sense of intimacy, that you showed up in a Discord and you like sort of felt like you knew everybody even if you didn't. And showing up in a Discord that has 100,000 people versus a Discord that has 2,000 people, like that experience is very, very different. And it felt really important to maintain that sense of feeling like you belonged and a sense of intimacy in our community. So we intentionally capped the community at 2,000 members. It's application gated. People become inactive and then churn. They can always come back in, but then that allows space for new members to join as well. So that feels very different than audience, which feels like it's boundless and you can reach many, many people through these different properties and media outlets that are interested and excited about what you're building, but don't have the bandwidth or don't have the same engagement style as wanting to be a part of the community. And so we've been very intentional about differentiating between those two types of audience and what we bring and what value we're presenting to both of those two types of people engaging with Voice Club. And there's been trade-offs to that, but I do think we feel pretty good about that because those 2,000 people who are in the Discord and who are members of, of the community are like evangelists for Boys Club. There's like a deep sense of being a part of it. That's really amazing. You've got jewelry. People wear your... We've got people, jewelry. People, fidgetal. They get jewelry, well, you got fidgetal. stuff. The fid- yeah, no, too much fidgetal. We actually have a ban on that word here. Okay, last question. <laughs> what is the coolest thing I can buy with my dimes today? Or maybe over the last little while. Can I buy stuff with my dimes? Oh. Maybe that's a question I should ask first. <laughs> can't buy anything with your dimes. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We're, um, this is a this is a really di- clear some case. Dimes. Of, I want dimes. Give me dimes. You, yeah, you can earn some dimes. We're like, what does loyalty look like, and how is this applied to a community? Let's roll something out and learn alongside our community with it. So we're at the very beginning stages of figuring out what dimes is for us. But yes, our hope is that it grows. The into, vision is yeah, the vision is you. You love the podcast. You post about the podcast. You get dimes. And then that unlocks like discount codes for Rhodes skincare that everybody's talking about or a free access to an event that is ticketed through Boys Club. And you're rewarding tangibly your community for engagement in stuff that you're doing for Boys Club. I love, first of all, that people want dimes, even though there's absolutely nothing to do with them right now. And that my belief was that there was a bunch of other things to do with them. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> Second of all, there's a whole other, I, I would love actually for us to come back and talk about this experiment sometime in the future, because I have a very strong set of opinions right now that I'm very open to be confronted around. But as of right now, I'm pretty, that's a future conversation. What Great. I love about this conversation is like, I think you are off again, building at your own edges, coming up against challenges and opportunities being true to your brand and to yourselves and building it out. And I think the insights and knowledge and examples that are going to emerge from that are, are going to be su- super powerful. So thank you for spending an hour here with us at the Building at the Edges podcast today. We're very excited to have you as part of the C Club community and look forward to seeing what other cool things you guys put out into the world. Thank you, Thanks, Jess. Jess. As always, for your support. This was fun. Hello, friends. Steph here, media team steward at C Club. If you liked this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review Building at the Edges. This helps other Web3 builders discover these valuable insights. And tell us what you think on Twitter. Tag us at, at CclubHQ. Thanks for listening. See you on the internet.